What's the stuff between King Kong's toes? Slow convention goers. <laughs> Kong only attacks when he's provoked. Yeah, it's no true. flash photography, please. <laughs> <laughs> he's behind the screen right now. <laughs> Well, welcome to King Kong, the eighth one of the world, turned 90 this year. Woo a milestone. My name is Blake Castleman. I'm a Salt Lake City-based screenwriter and film producer. And I'm going to allow the two people on either of my side. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be the experts of this panel, so I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves right now. You want to go first? You want me to? Go ahead. My name's Jacob, I am the owner-operator of Kaiju United, and I do a website that focuses primarily on monster stuff. Um, I live, breathe, and die movie monsters. Basically a walking encyclopedia. Uh, that's basically all I do, and uh, I'm excited to talk about King Kong. My name is Sean, uh, I'm known as Sean Smithson. As a writer, I've been at Fangoria Magazine, I've contributed to Movie Maker, a lot of freelance work, uh, wrote at Screen Anarchy for years, who I'm probably going to be returning to. Uh, we used to be called Twitch Film, then Twitch happened and we ended up uh, selling them their name, uh, the name. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, again, grew up as a movie kid, when we get into the memories, I'll go into more of that, but you know, my earliest, literally my first memory involves King Kong, which we'll talk about later, but yeah. Super glad to be here and super glad to see so many people here to honor the big one. Thank you. Okay, so, thank you, Sean. All right, so, uh, I'm gonna survey Sean and Jacob, but uh, we're gonna do a show of hands type of thing. Uh, Jacob, which Kong did you see first, which version? I saw Peter Jackson's Kong from 2005 first. It's probably the earliest cinema memory I had. I was uh, carbon dating myself here. Seven years old when it came out. So uh, I'm an old man now. <laughs> uh, the first one I saw was the original 1933 version when it was the only version that existed. Um, I was three years old. I still remember it. Um, I lived in Baltimore, Maryland back when they had a uh, local programming, uh, so I saw it on uh, UHF TV, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, of course it was life-changing, it led, I, it was really, the be it was the birth of my imagination, it was the first architect of my imagination, it led me to Ray Harryhausen, it led me to Woo! Universal Monsters, which led me to stuff like this, which I saw at five years old. Oops, thanks, Mom. Um, but yeah, yeah. So King Kong 1933. Oddly not my favorite, which we'll get to that later. My first con was- it's my most respected, though, as a caveat, so. My first con was the 1933 version. I was five years old, I saw it on TV, and I remember that moment where Fay Ray was set out side the big fence, the big gate, and it's you, you can hear Kong coming and waiting, the anticipation of waiting for the opportunity to see Kong was probably the first time I ever really felt suspense on that level as a little kid, and I was hooked. From that point on, I was hooked on the movie and I've been hooked on the character. I wanted to survey the audience by show of hands. Whose first King Kong experience was the original 1933 film? That's a good chunk. Okay, thank you. Whose was the 1976 remake? Wow. Excellent. Who, like Jacob, uh, was born just a few years ago? And, uh, <laughs> the Peter Jackson one was their first experience. Ah, uh, that's a good number too. That's, that's nice. All right, whose first experience was the 1960s King Kong vs. Godzilla movie? Yeah. <laughs> oh, someone at the back! All right! Yeah. 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 Absolutely, he, he won an applause and a good job from us. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the original King Kong movie. Um, <laughs> and, and we wanted to make this conversational. Um, 
if, if you have a burning question as we're going along, please raise your hand. We're going to try and have um, time for audience questions at the end. But um, what is it about the King Kong, the original King Kong movie? Jacob, you've seen it. You, we talked about how you, how you watched it recently, kind of with this kind of new adult perspective. What is it about it that still makes it such an effective film 90, uh, you know, 90 years later? I think it feels timeless. Um, it's one of, I mean, I rewatched it as an adult going into it thinking, is this film going to be overrated? Which is, uh, please don't crucify me when I say that. But uh, as an adult viewing it, it held up just as much for a 90 year old film. And a lot of movies from that time don't. Um, Every shot feels cinematic. Every shot feels like it could have been a black and white movie from 1954. It's just a, a super timeless, uh, pioneering cinematic experience. And there's still effects in that movie that I still look at and I go, how did they do that? <laughs> how did you guys pull that off? What do you want? What do you want from me? What, what makes the movie seem so timeless? Oh, um, well, I'll get out of the way the things that I think date it, and, but I, you know, I love old Marlena Dietrich films, so date it to me is not a, a bad term. Um, it's the style of the day. It's a little acty, Faye Ray's a little like, you know, and Carl Denham's like a little hey! But other than that, the shot design, the pacing, um, some of the stuff that you might be able to, I think it's suddenly there in 76, which I'll get into when, when I get a chance to talk about that film. But um, even, this, even the, race, the race stuff with the villagers on the island, because back during this time, they were making a lot of like black review blues and like, you're at the nightclub and Cab Calloway would be there and there was a very big thing going on with black entertainers. Uh, Carol, Carol Baker, um, you know, having to go to France. And I think Kong was one of the first films that put that onto film as far as like, because Kong is basically being kidnapped from his island. I mean, it's a parable for slavery in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that makes the film timeless. It's, there is a lot of meat on the bone there as far as that. I don't know if it's accidental, uh, and I don't know if it's just how history has played out, uh, but yeah, that's one of the things that makes it timeless for me. And then just the way it's shot and the way it's edited, it really cooks right along. It moves right into the story. You get on the boat. There's plenty of the monster. Yeah. That's what makes it timeless to me. And I actually like the colorized version too, which is really, really weird. But I was real I watched it a few weeks ago. I was really surprised at how well it translated to having a color palette on it as well. But yeah. When you talk about the acting, um, my favorite line from uh, Carl Benham. They're on the island, a stegosaurus shows up, and they shoot first and ask questions later. <laughs> and they kill the stegosaurus. One of the uh, sailors go, what is that? And Carl Denham says, something from the dinosaur family. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, just some great lines. And the, the whole relationship between Jack Driscoll and Fe, uh, uh, Anne Darrow, Fay Ray, yeah. it's, it's just sexism, like crazy. <laughs> and, and then she falls for him. And, and, uh, and I... I been preparing for this, I watched the original again. Fay Ray screams no less than 54 times. <laughs> That's what he hired her to do, though. He goes, yeah, uh, yeah. how's your scream? How's yeah. your scream? Um, there was some censors. Can, can I rewind something I said about the actiness, too? Um, that said, Fay Ray looks like she could be born in the 80s and be a huge movie star now at the same time. Uh, that's another thing that's very, very timeless about the film. It's just her, her personal. Yeah. So we have, the, the, there was actually some stuff that was censored from the film that was lost for a long time. Uh, of course, there's the, the, uh, the spider pit scene. Um, you, had, you had the brontosaurus mauling crewmen in the water, uh, chasing one up a tree and killing him. You had Kong undressing Andero and sniffing his fingers. <laughs> Kong biting and stepping on natives when he attacks the village. Kong biting a man in New York. 
A comic mistaking a sleeping woman for Anne and dropping her to her death after realizing his mistake. Um, and then there's the giant insects and spiders and reptile-like predators. What's weird is, uh, as I was saying, my first memory is as a really young kid. How I, how I got into, uh, how I really got into King Kong is I was watching a neighbor um, when I lived in Baltimore. I was running around. I, I even remember it. I had like a little cow safety pin around my neck. I was playing Superman back before you could buy Superman capes to play in. And uh, I thought my neighbor, this college student, was playing with a toy. And I went over, because we had these sliding glass doors uh, that opened up onto a common area, and uh, he wasn't. He was actually redoing, he was, a, he was a Johns Hopkins film student, and he was redoing the Empire State Building scene from the end of King Kong in stop motion as one of his college projects. So I got to sit there with him, and he, told, he taught me how to like click, uh, click the thing. I kind of forget my original point, though. But, um, yeah. The censored stuff. Spider oh yeah, yeah. So I ended up hanging out with all these Baltimore film students, and they would take me around to these screenings in basements or at the college. Cause saw Mothra and Masquerade Death really soon after that. They took me, and I was well behaved, so I got to go around with them. And I can remember because back then you used to get the 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 copies either on eight millimeter or sixteen millimeter from the libraries or the colleges. And Johns Hopkins had a great film program to the great library. And I swear to God I've seen some of those scenes. You did, because the negatives for the original film were destroyed. Uh, Hollywood didn't practice film preservation back in the 30s and 40s. However, in Philadelphia in 1970, uh, a, a, a full, uncensored version of the film was discovered in someone's That's what I saw, because it was yeah. 19, late 70s, 71, yeah. dude. And so you Should had, university. you had wow. universities were the first ones wow. to get their hands on the restored footage. And then at some point, Universal decided to restore the film and, 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 and kind of painstakingly put it back together. That's great. And I, so the version you can get on Blu-ray and DVD now is the restored version with all the censored stuff put back yeah. in. Yeah. And that's, that's the version I saw and preparing, they had it, it, was Amazing. Stream, it was streaming on Internet Archive. Yeah. And that's the version I saw in getting ready for this uh, this panel was, was the full version with all the The brontosaurus? The brontosaurus and all the wow. sensor stuff and, and, and the insects too. That's great. And it was interesting because I also watched the Peter Jackson one a few days later. And so it was interesting yeah. um, uh, contrasting, you know, the original uh, Spider Pit version with your Jackson's inset version. Is this your hand up? Yes. Yeah, yes. So, so the restored version was actually the British version that they got a print of because the British, the British ver I mean, not the British version, but in right, Britain the they British never French censored the film, so it was a British print. Um, yeah. And then they never found the, the actual Spider Pit yeah, I was gonna say it But that. what was cool, what Peter Jackson did, was he's like, well, if we can't find it, why don't we recreate it? They did a whole recreation, which is super awesome. And I think you can see it on YouTube. TV. It's on YouTube. Yeah. It's on the bonus features on the DVD. Yeah. It's really cool it's so if you guys good. haven't seen it. It's like uh, so the awesome. best recreation it can be. Okay, I wanted to shift our attention from censored and giant spiders to the Empire State <laughs> yeah. Building. Why is it so iconic? Why has it become such an iconic scene, do you think? I think at the time it was one of the tallest buildings in the world, so for a monster to climb that, it's like Mothra uh, cocooning up Tokyo Tower. It's just a, a landmark that people recognize, and it's like, oh man, there's a monster on the building that I walk past to work every day. Why do you think the Empire State Building so... Iconic and important. It was the it was the most recognizable landmark in the biggest city in the world at the time. I mean, it was like standing on top of Mount Everest. You know, it was the concrete Mount Everest of the time. And incredibly recognizable. The only thing that probably would have challenged it is the Eiffel Tower. It's yeah. really like a, a visual landmark. There's that, there's that little known French version of King Kong where he climbs the <laughs> <laughs> He's all, oh, oh, oh. And he's wearing like a beret with a Jean Coutil. <laughs> and he's smoking a cigarette. He's got a baguette. <laughs> and he gets down with it. He's got a baguette instead of a beret. <laughs> oh my god. So, so King Kong was like... I'm looking for something. I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm looking for a King Kong really. <laughs> so King Kong was a hit. Uh, it cost 672000 to make, which is equivalent of $15.2 today. 
It made five million at the box office, five million and change, which is about 115 million today. And you, you know, you look at these films that are making billions of dollars in the worldwide box office. But you got to imagine how small movie audiences were back then, and to make the equivalent of 115 million dollars. Bucks. What in '33? In '33. I would kind of counter that though, because almost everybody in America went to the movies back then. I mean, that's what, how people got through the depression and stuff like that. I mean, do you have a number? I'm just curious. I'm well, it's, it, yeah, it made five million, which is about 150 million today. So it, it made a profit. It made a big profit. Everybody went to see it. Everybody went to see it. But I was just kind of doing a, another counter uh, comparison to. You know, the billion dollar box office that films often do today. It makes me curious about how many people went to went to a movie like that back then and do now. Yeah. Um, I would also add that the 33 film was re-released in 1952, I think. And that kind of also added to, I would think, the lasting legacy of Kong. Because back then, you know, you didn't have DVD or anything like that, as you all know but you would go back and see the re-release of the movies. So um, I don't want to get too sidetracky here, but that re-release not only made it a bunch more money, it also led to the path that my guy and my main expertise, Godzilla, which we'll get into in a couple of movies later. But, but, but Kong was also one of the first feature films sold to television as well. Yes, that too. So, but like every successful film, uh, <laughs> gotta cash in. They rushed out a what? sequel. It was cute. They rushed out a sequel. Son of Khan came out. Okay, so Khan, Khan premiered in March of 33 in New York City, and then it went into wide release the following month in April. Uh, big hit, and so they rushed out the sequel. Son of Khan came out in December of 33, so <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of time it was a in between. So what we have, we have Carl Denham coming back, Bruce Armstrong, and uh, Frank Riker comes back as the ship captain. They also brought back the Chinese cook character, who actually has a hero moment in that movie, which I thought was cool. Um, the the Fade Ray, Fade Ray was replaced by a woman named Helen Mack, an actress named Helen Mack, who uh, played a little bit more of a New York kind of street smart, tougher character than that Fred Ray played. Um, and the featured, uh, the son of Khan, they go back to the island because Carl Denham's on the run from creditors and, and a grand jury <laughs> indictment and yeah. lots of other people angry at him over what happened with Kong. And uh, so they come back to the island, they're looking for, for a treasure that's given to them under, under uh, you know, it's dubious information, but they, they have really no other choice. So they go back to the island and they find a 12 foot, tall, cute, white ape that is Kong's son. And uh, a little bit different relationship with, uh, with Kong Jr. He actually it's saves... Favorite, it's Fay Ray, I'm just saying. <laughs> to Fay Ray's credit, she was much more interested than the love interest in Son of Kong. She was, yeah. She was a lot more interesting. Um, but this, 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 this character is actually helps them out and has a... Has a hero moment that reminded me of Terminator 2 oh, yeah. at the end. <laughs> because the, the island suddenly, I, I hope I'm not giving away any spoilers here. How dare you spoil the <laughs> <laughs> film? The, the film has been out for 90 years. <laughs> but, but they're on the island, they're, they're, they're trying to find this treasure, and then the storm happens and the island, this earthquake happens and the island falls to pieces and everyone on the island dies, except for those who are able to get on the boat. and. Kong gets to the very top of the island as it's sinking, and he has, I can't remember which character he has, he has one of the characters. It's Carl Denham. Carl, Carl, Carl Denham, and he, and he sinks and his hand is up above the water. Well, James Cameron did get his start with Piranha 2, so go. maybe he's trying to give a kick back to another <laughs> underappreciated sequel. So, uh, needless to say, Son of Khan didn't make nearly the money that its <laughs> predecessor made. Sequel never does. Uh, so we jump up to 1949 and we have Mighty yeah. Joe Young. So good. Oh my gosh. And Mighty Joe Young was directed by Ernest P. Sh Schoenstack and Marion C. Cooper, who directed the original King Kong. 
And we have Robert Armstrong again, but he's playing, uh, I guess, a, a club owner? Kind of a... Yeah. yeah. But anyway, he goes to Africa. Instead of going to a mysterious Skull Island, he goes to Africa and, and uh, convinces uh, Joe's owner to bring Joe back to New York so he can do this club show. This fixes a lot, I think, of what they figured out what was wrong with Son of Kong, too. Right. Yeah. As far as, like, humanizing the eight protagonists a little more, making yeah. it lovable, making it something that, back then they didn't do this, but these days you can make a doll out of, and, like, kids could, like, clutch like a teddy bear. Um, and the emotional, I mean, this is easily, for me, the most, well, I mean, the end of King Kong is pretty darn emotional, but this, the entire thing sustains this really sentimental, emotional core because of the little girl and her relationship yeah. with Mighty Joe Young. And then the fire scene, oh my gosh, you know, it's like... Yeah. The, the version I saw, they, they tinted the film for the fire scene, which was really... Like Joker? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it really brought out the heroic and suspenseful moments of that scene for Joe. All right, now we're going to shift to Jacob's wheelhouse, <laughs> and we're going to talk about, oh, Half Human. <laughs> All right, so Half Human is a 1955 film that is actually banned in Japan. You can watch it if you go on official sources, but it's basically a Yeti film, like a Bigfoot movie, um, about this, this ape creature that does his Yeti stuff and that kills people and whatnot. But it was kind of banned in Japan because, uh, much like the original film, there was some um, questionable treatment of indigenous peoples living in the mountainous areas this takes place in. But uh, it was directed by Shiro Honda, the uh, director of the original Godzilla film, and many, 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 many other uh, tokusatsu kaiju films of that time. Um, and this was actually one of his next films right after the original Godzilla, so it's quite interesting to see where he went right after that. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Half Human on the heels of a failed attempt to get the licensing rights to King Kong, or was it, or was that later on? I think it was, I, I think this one was maybe an attempt to do uh, what we'll talk about later, the Kong exploitation kind of uh, imitator stuff. <laughs> but um, I think this one was just more of a Bigfoot Yeti kind of movie. It wasn't trying to be Kong. He stays in the mountains and stuff. He was still kind of like poking around for the next big monster too, I think, before realizing that Godzilla was the through line for yeah. everything. Because Mothra, right? Yeah, was, um, yeah, they just wanted to make more monster movies because the original Godzilla, not to make this a Godzilla panel, uh, was a big hit when it came out in Japan, and people started just really liking monsters. So, what do we do next? Well, let's talk about the Yetis that live in the, uh, you know, the winter parts of the mountainous areas of Asia. But then, 1962. But then this masterpiece comes out, Aww. and uh, legitimately one of my favorite Godzilla films and favorite films ever. Um, I will say, if you watch the Japanese version of the film, it's a uh, really strong satire on media sensationalism. Like in the in the plot, basically, Godzilla's been attacking cities for a while, and Mr. Taco, we'll call him, a pharmaceutical CEO, is sick of Godzilla in the newspapers, and he wants his own monster to be in the newspapers to advertise <laughs> his pharmaceutical company. So they go get King Kong. You know? Yeah. So what else could you know? What could possibly go wrong? A Godzilla-sized King. A Godzilla-sized King Kong. They actually grew King Kong and uh, weakened Godzilla's atomic breath so they could equalize each other. Um, before I let you guys comment, I will say that this is the first appearance in color for Godzilla and King Kong, which is really cool. So it's like a pretty monumental monster history moment. So the American version which I watched recently, is uh, seven minutes shorter than the Japanese version. And it's got a lot of uh, segues into these reporters that I guess are there for information dump, dumping. Yeah, they did a lot of, uh, they put a lot of journalists in the English versions of these kaiju films because they thought, 
Americans were too dumb to understand what was going on. Kind of like in the original Godzilla released his uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters, they had uh, Raymond Burr be the uh, Steve Martin journalist. Um, but I will also add a historical context at the time. Um, and surprisingly, um, the Kong suit actors played by a professional wrestler at the time. So that's why if you watch the movie, the uh, Kong actor actually throws Godzilla over his shoulder <laughs> and like suplexes him a little bit. Because about 1962 was when wrestling was exploding <laughs> in Japan. So you capitalize on that a little bit. You also shows a tree down Godzilla's throat, which is always <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, do you guys have anything to say? I saw it in theaters uh, when I was in the 70s on a re-release. Around the, It was around the same time they put out Godzilla vs. Megalon, which played all summer long when I lived in Chico, California. Um, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I mean, I love all these movies, and I'm, everything gets watched through its own lens. You know, I don't watch a movie like this like with The Exorcist or like I would an Alfred Hitchcock film, but I was still like, damn, that ate suit is pretty rough. <laughs> and, and just, and just going, oh, I wish Ray Harry Austin had done this as a little kid. Um, watched it a couple of times through my 20s, you know, uh, under the influence on Bad Movie Night. But when the Japanese version dropped on that Criterion set that I picked up, I was like, okay, I get it now. It's like, this is cool. And I, I actually think now that we're talking about it, I think it shares something with 76 in a way, which I'll try to remember. We'll make it to that. Well, and, and uh, you know, you, you, you talked about how uh, Khan turns into Gavera. Um, Khan, oh, yes. Khan, Khan kind of, uh, they, they, they uh, give him a, a power. In yeah, that movie. Khan gets electricity powers in this movie after he gets hit by lightning. <laughs> was it because it was supposed to be uh, King Kong versus Frankenstein? Yes, it was, and I was just about to get there. So this movie was actually, so Marion C. King Kong versus Prometheus, uh, basically King Kong versus Frankenstein, and the Godzilla team wanted to make Godzilla versus Frankenstein. So uh, some rights thing, like Four the Germans. planets, yeah, right? <laughs> the planets came, you know, the planets aligned, and we got King Kong versus Godzilla. They never um, got the right. So name. the Frankenstein aspect remained in the film. Godzilla turns into what I call Gabara, which is the the bully monster in Godzilla's Revenge that kind of electrocutes you when he touches you. But uh, yeah, Kong gets uh, super mega Frankenstein powers in this movie, and it, they never tell you why. King Kong versus Godzilla is a great example of the results you get when you can work across the aisle. Yeah, yeah totally. It was one of the first uh, huge Japanese-American co-productions. And then, uh, well, you and I talked about this, and uh, I grew up, I don't know if anyone else grew up with this idea, but I grew up hearing that the Japanese version ended differently. Yeah. Yeah. The version that I saw, the American version, they go tumbling into the water, and who comes out of the water? Kong. Kong. No Godzilla. So Kong won. But I grew up, and I grew up with this, uh, with this story, or this urban legend that said, oh yeah, the Japanese version, Godzilla wins. Jacob? That's a myth. Uh, I'm here to myth bust, I'm sorry. Uh, that actually came from a book around the time uh, you guys were kids. Um, there was a series of monster books that were like white. They had big, bold font. There was one for Godzilla, one for Frankenstein. I think it was published around 72. But in that book, uh, the author says that there were two different endings for some reason. But as the Japanese version is widely available, um, you can watch it on YouTube if you want it officially. I recommend watching it officially. Um, they both go tumbling in the water and Kong comes out. And, um, and that's true for the Japanese version. Yes, yeah. The Japanese version, Kong walks out. Wasn't there a reason for that or something? Because I know we had talked about it. I think so, but like in the Japanese version, um, you hear both of their roars. So at the end of the American cut, I think you just hear Kong's roar, and they're like, well, I hope we see him again someday. <laughs> and in the Japanese version, they both tumble in the water, and the, the, uh, the two guys in the helicopter say, well, I hope that's the last we've seen of Godzilla. And Godzilla swims off. And then uh, yeah. you see Kong walk away, and then you hear Kong's roar and Godzilla's roar, just the sound bites. There's no physical <laughs> Godzilla coming out of the water, none of that.
Well, we know the Japanese see Godzilla again, but they also saw King Kong. Yeah! Woo! Yep! Yeah. Okay. Love How many of you people have seen this movie? Oh, yeah! Woo. I love you guys. <laughs> I love this movie so much. And if I'm going to elevator pitch and sell this to you guys, this is a Japanese uh, King Kong movie, of course. But not only does he fight Mechana Kong, you know, Mecha Kong. He also fights Gorosaurus, who'd go on to fight alongside Godzilla. But the villain of this movie is a devious <laughs> evil scientist by the name of Doctor Who. <laughs> uh, and this was before the Doctor Who Doctor Who came out. Yeah, it's H-U, I think, or, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's H-U, yeah, but in the English text it's W-H-O. Uh, um, um. But, uh... Yeah, this film stars Akira Takarada. It's uh, you know the handsome leading man in most of the Godzilla and sci-fi films at the time. Linda Miller, who was an American actress that starred in some of these movies. She's also in The Green Slime, if you're a deep cutter. Mm. Um, but basically, uh, Doctor Who wants to mine this uh, emerald stuff so that he can uh, program his robot Kong. But nobody can get to the radioactivity um, of the mineral, so he needs the real King Kong. <laughs> and then uh, shenanigans ensue, and it's a crazy wild ride. The thing I love about this movie, too, is who knows who Sid and Marty Croft are? Oh, yeah. Like H.R. Puffin stuff, oh, yeah. Litzville, Land of the Lost. They were the co producers on this, and as someone who grew up on all of their content, Electro Woman and Dinah Girl, Speed Buggy, all that stuff. I can see the DNA of Sid and Marty Croft in here too, with like the robot stuff and the and the yeah, it's almost like Doctor Shrinker or something. It's like yeah, I yeah, think I it was I think it was Rankin Base. A uh, Rankin Base. You're right. You're right. Um, I'm wrong. They were. The, uh, it was Rudolph. based on the Rankin Base cartoon called the King Kong Hour or the King Kong Show. It was from the '60s around the same time. So Rankin Base came to Japan and was like, "You guys got some Kong movie rights." Why don't we make him into this movie? Is that on YouTube? Uh, the show? Yeah, the old Japanese cartoon? It used to be. Or is it out on DVD? It's out on DVD. You, can, you can find it. It's probably Saturday pretty morning. expensive too. Yeah, so sorry about that. Saturday morning. morning it was Sid Marty Croft helped do the Kiss movie. I'm wrong. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just, 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 just for, uh, to set the record straight, Doctor Who, the TV series, came out in 63. 63, okay. So, I don't know, perhaps the English guys were responding to that. And they were like, well, let's make Doctor Who into a bad guy that wants King Kong. <laughs> All right, and this uh, takes us to 1976 with uh, the first full remake of the original Kong. Um, I'm pulling a clip here for 76. So uh, let's watch the trailer first so I can contextualize some of it. Can we get plenty of volume back there, please? Here, I'll talk until he's here. You can stop yeah. it. We'll watch it afterwards. So, um, again, being born in 67, I was prime target for the advertising of this film, which was incessant. It was Kiss, Monkey's Level, Blitz in the media when this came out. Every comic book had the poster on the inside of the cover. There was a board game, which I would kill to have now, where Kong climbs up the tower. There were goofy, what little kid can dress as King Kong in a box Halloween outfit, but I tried. It's when I was the world's smallest King Kong in 1977. But, um, yeah, this played all summer long in Chico. Uh, and when it was when it was on its last legs, that first run, then they paired it with the Bad News Bears, which I was just in heaven. But growing up in the 70s, I mean, remembering the time, too, uh, this came out in 76, started production in early 75. This is an era of um, protest and political paranoia thrillers, like All the President's Men, The Parallax View. Does anybody know about these movies? Um, okay, um, you know, post-water, like immediate post-Watergate, people are really cynical and pissed off. And we're in the middle of an energy crisis in America. The gas lines are hundreds of cars long. You know, people are killing each other for two gallons of gas. 
This comes out, and the thing I love about this movie that that the Jackson film doesn't do, not I'm not saying it's a bad thing, that's, an, that's a period of mosh piece, but this and its updating to modern times, having the oil company looking for the island is really, really, really current for for when this film was put out. And then your protagonist now is not some chisel chinned sea captain. It's a hippie. It's a it's a it's a trust fund hippie who has decided to become an activist who gets his ass onto the ship. And there's a great scene where like Charles Grodin, the guy who's kind of the Carl Denham of this, but he's the oil magnet guy who's like his whole his whole career is riding on this gamble that there's an island behind this fog bank. And they're like, here's why we're really here. There's going to be oil here. And that's when Jeff Bridges emerges as being a stowaway and tells them the real history of Skull Island. And it's one of the creepiest scenes I've ever seen. So you have, you have these breaking down, like completely uh, introducing new types of characters. Again, like the, the moneyed hippie. And the movie starts right off. He's the first one you meet, not Dwan, who's the Andero of this film. They find her floating in the ocean. You know, so and they're all thrown, and within the first, I think, 25 minutes, they're they're on the island. They broke it through the fog bank, and then just stuff like starts starts popping off. But it's really funny. Charles Grodin is one of the greatest uh, serial comic actors we've ever had. If you've seen Midnight Run, or he's in a lot of 70s stuff. Really dry humor guy, amazing as as the oil magnet. Um, full if you like 70s stuff and watch a ton of that, like old cop shows, like I do. It's, Full of faces, you're gonna you're gonna feel like it's a, a, like at home because Ren Rene Auberjonois, who is uh, Odo on Deep Space Nine, is in it. Martin Balsam, um, but yeah, the thing that resonates with me most is its uh, kind of activist attitude and also the way that the natives are treated. Um, there's a there's a there's a line in the film where uh, Jeff Bridges' character, the activist kid, you know, they're like. Uh, they've met the natives, they've been aggressive, and Duan and Dara has not yet been kidnapped by them to be offered up to Kong as, as, uh, as a bride. But uh, they're like, well, let's just go in there, you know, blast them to high heaven. And Jeff Bridges is like, if you do that, every kid in America will burn down every Petrox gas station there is. <laughs> I thought that was really, really, really... I don't want to say brave, but interesting for a film like that that was also aimed at a demographic like myself who was 11 years old. So that's the thing that makes that movie timeless for me, one of the things that makes it my favorite. And Rick Baker's uh, performance in the ape suit. Carlo Rimbaldo's Rimbaldi stuff can, ugh, but yeah. Who has not seen this film? It holds up really well. It really does, and you have two future Academy Award winning actors yeah. at the beginning of their career in this film. Well, Jeff Bridges had already won an Oscar by, by that point oh, had for, for Thunderbolt and oh, Lightfoot. Okay, Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but Jessica Lange, it's her first movie. It's her first movie. It's her baby, yeah. And, is... and, then you, and, and then on top of that, you have, uh, you mentioned Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin. Yeah. He is so good at chewing up the scenery in every scene he's in because he's playing the bad guy. And I don't think he had a chance to play the bad guy a lot yeah. in his films. And yeah. it's great to watch. It's, it's so desperate. It's so yeah. hilariously desperate. I will say that this is the one I've seen the least. And uh, I wish to rectify that. Um, as a kid, I watched it and it just didn't really click with me. Maybe it's more of an adult picture for adults nowadays. but. Um, I always have remembered seeing the DVD cover of him on the Trade Center. That's just an iconic, an iconic image of King Kong now. I would say right up next to Empire State Building's promotional oh, sure. images. But it's probably the, the, the most solid representation of the Twin Towers we have on film, too, yeah. at this point. Makes it, makes it very, very poignant to watch. And um, maybe this is speculatory, but for my generation, perhaps it was a little more... Uh, I don't want to say taboo, but something like that, to watch this movie with those towers kind of when we were kids because, uh, I mean, I was um, three years old when that happened, so maybe it's that, and then we come in with uh, Kong in 05, that totally just goes back to the period piece and people were more 
interested in that kind of cinema at the time. I don't know. Right down to the acty style, you know, acty acty style in two o'clock. It was more escapist. especially Jack Black, you know. Yeah. Hey, chief, I see it now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perhaps that's a little bit of speculation on my part, but I have not really seen this. More it than just kind of lapsed too, because yeah. blockbusters came along, all the Star Wars films, your generation, you guys, you guys had everything coming at you from all directions. That's what you remember. Me and Blake are like, Jaws is coming out. <laughs> you know, like in six months, there's going to be another movie we're going to really want to see. Yeah, it, it got lost in the wash for a while, but that beautiful 4K restor, uh, restoration that's just been released is check that pretty out. sweet. And if you like old school stuff like matte paintings and green screen stuff that's done well, where it looks phony but it looks great, like Ray Harryhausen said about CGI, if it looks too real, it's going to become mundane. This has a, like a nice, really quaint, kind of old school look to it. And you can see the hands-on artistry I more feel, than you can these days. I feel that way about King Kong versus Godzilla and the tokusatsu films wholeheartedly. One thing I wanted to last, uh, touch on last before we move on is Jessica Lange and the gorilla. Um, in the original film, Fay Ray, uh, really didn't bond with with Kong. This was the first time we have the female character bonding with Kong, and I thought that that, to me, that was the most. And watching it years later as an adult, as someone who's been married and has kids, that was that was the most engaging part of the film. For the me. bath, like the in the waterfall and that and stuff. And on her, her, yeah. But also, she's trying to, to get him to not put himself in harm's way uh, with the helicopter. Which is interesting, because Jackson then had that going on with this thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's kind of remained throughout the rest of Kong's film history, too, in some ways. I'll get to the Monsterverse stuff in a little bit, but he's like Jackson's film, you said, did that. Skull Island kind of did that. Even Godzilla vs. Kong. It's a weird inversion of the a boy and his dog kind yeah. of show, you know. Yeah. Very briefly, 1986. <laughs> so ten years later, you have the same producer and the same director coming together to make a sequel, a direct sequel to King Kong called King Kong Lives. How does King Kong live? Heart transplant. Heart transplant. The world's largest heart transplant. Um, Jessica, uh, uh, Linda Hamilton, only a couple years removed from the first Terminator movie, was the star of it, and uh, Liz Kerwin from BJ and the Bear, John Ashton from the Addams Family was in it. Um, it was one of the biggest bombs of the 80s, we'll move on. <laughs> there, there is a push to remake it. No. Which brings us to the early 2000s. Now, the genesis for the King Kong remake in 2005 came from the Lord of the Rings films. How, you might ask? Well, the Lord of the Rings films made a bajillion dollars. So Universal came to Peter Jackson and said, here's a blank check, Mr. Jackson. What would you like to do? And he said, I'd like to remake King Kong, because that was his favorite film I, growing I, up. I think the original script he wrote for a King Kong remake was about 1996. So he was wow. dying to make Kong for a while. Yes. It goes back further than that. He was, Universal had hired him to make a King Kong in 96. But then the remake of Godzilla came out. The remake of Mighty Joe Young came out. And they're like... Wait a minute, too many monsters. We're scared about doing this. We're not going to do Kong yet. They pushed it back. So Peter Jackson said, we're going to do Lord of the Rings now. We can do Lord of the Rings now. And then after the success of the Lord of the Rings, Universal said, hey, Jackson, you still want to do Kong? And he said, yes, I want to do Kong. Yep, that's 100% all true. Now, there's, I, we're, we're getting slow on, slow on time. So there's, there's a lot of things I love about this film, but there's a lot of problematic things about this film. Yes. Number one, it's way too long, yes, it is. clocking in at three hours and 17 minutes. That's Jackson, um, that's Jackson for you. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a theatrical cut. And that's a theatrical cut. 
<laughs> the other thing, the other thing is this, again, I, I wondered about this when I watched it the other day. What was with the subplot with the young kid and the first maid and the whole Joseph Conrad? I think he was trying to Ernst Lubitsch stuff up, like the, the old 30s movies that had a cast of like 15 people all in the hotel bouncing around each other. I think I think you're right on that. Yeah, because he's also really into that old Ernst Lubitsch, which I know that's a, a semi-obscure name to a lot of people, but uh, uh, like Ernst Lubitsch was the guy who created filmmaking. Uh, he's probably more important than Orson Welles at the end of the day. But there's also a lot of Jurassic Park influence in this movie. You got you got the stampeding brontosauruses, which is a fun scene. But then you have you have uh, velociraptors, uh, which started the stampede, uh, wreaking havoc. But then my favorite favorite part of the entire film is Kong fighting three T Rexes at the same time. Take that. <laughs> Jurassic World. <laughs> we have three of them. But I love, I love the scene at the end. There, there's, there's a couple. There, there's, there's homages to the original film. I love at the very end of the fight, the last T-Rex that Kong kills. He does the thing with the jaw, and then when the T-Rex falls, he does the, the thing where he's like playing with the mouth, and Kong does that in the original film. Um, also, when we go back to the Empire State Building, which kind of shows you that that the killing is, in an odd way, not done in malice, but out of you know uh, survival, the, the the needs of nature. Right, <laughs> right. We go back to the Empire State Building when Khan is brought to New York. They don't. I thought it was interesting with how long the movie is. They didn't have time to show us how they transported Khan from the island. I think that's so. that is the big elephant in the room with every Khan thing. And there's actually been a couple of what. what Cody Goodfellow, do you remember Cody Goodfellow? I do. Brilliant, brilliant writer, you should look him up. Uh, he writes a lot of short stories, and he wrote a short story about how they got Kong from the island I mean, onto the boat, and it's hilarious. I mean, in uh, the King Kong vs. Godzilla film, they just tied into a bunch of balloons. <laughs> yeah. like the yeah. just... They did show um, on the ship in the 71. They, yeah, there's, there's a three year lapse. Had probably the best. There's a three year lapse between the island and the ship. They actually gave him swimming lessons. Okay. So training montage. Is that in the, is that in the extended edition? Yeah. The, the, the 17 hour extended edition? Yeah. I think they explain it in the tie in video game too. If anyone my age has played that awesome game, they, they I think they tear gas and knock them out and they just put them It's a the fantasy. Yeah. We don't care how they got it there. Yeah. We just want to see the New York. So, it's, so instead of, instead of uh, practical effects, uh, stop motion, uh, rear projection, uh, uh, miniatures, uh, they did, of course, coming off the heels of Lord of the Rings and the Gollum character, Andy Serkis did a motion capture performance with yeah. Kong, and I really, He's here. I really thought it was interesting. Look at the bottom <coughs> picture, where he's on the very top of the entire series. Look at his stance. That's how That's Serkis cool. played Kong, kind of more like a real gorilla stance, as opposed to upright, like the he other films to, played him. He went to Yogan, no, wait a minute, Wakanda? Uganda, to look at the gorillas. They yeah. told him not to, but he's like, I need to see what gorillas in the wild. He did it anyway. So anyway, um, I want to say too that out of all of the three versions we're really talking about here today, uh, this has my favorite climax in it though. I think it's, it's the most so resonant good. of all of them. Yeah. The way the sun's coming up over the river and you can feel the morning chill and like, it's just like this day's not gonna be a good one. You know, and I love daylight horror. I love horror that takes place in the daylight, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this kind of reminded me of that. It's like no matter it, the sun may be shining, but this is a horrible, horrible thing. That's okay, happening. so we have like two minutes left. I wanted to talk really quickly about the reboot of Khan. Well, I, well, I, um, I really like this movie. I think it's got a lot of heart. I'm appreciative of the differences it takes. Like, there are no dinosaurs in this movie. It's like the three-legged lizard skull crawler thing. I think that's really dope. And then the Vietnam stuff's pretty interesting. And, and, yes? I would point out that, like, it's interesting how in uh, the Jackson version, uh, it was a uh, circus who mocap Kong in that film, but he ultimately went on to mocap uh, Caesar in Planet of the Apes. Yes. And in Dawn of Planet of the Apes, the, the actor who played Toba, he vocabs Kong and comes yep. to the Yeah, Terry Notary. Yeah. Also, plays the guy. Also, does anybody like like metal? 
in here? Yeah. Like, do you all know who Cannibal Corpse is? Yep. Okay, uh, their bass player, Alex Webster, has a project called Blotted Science with a guitar player from a, an amazing prog band called Watchtower. And they take, uh, they took a bunch of scenes from Peter Jackson's King Kong, like they took the bug attack scene and timed their music exactly to it. If you like that kind of thing and you like King Kong, I promise you it's mind blowing. You really cool. need to check it out. It's called Blotted Science. Pretty cool. And then, and then four years after, and uh, COVID probably had something to do with this, but four years after Kong Skull Island, we had Godzilla versus Kong. Hey, it's a, it's a pretty fun ride. Like they they kind of learned their lesson from the last Monsterverse film, Godzilla King of the Monsters. I love that. It's great. I love it. I love all the Monsterverse movies. But and last but not least, we wanted to show you a height chart for King Kong. You can see way at the end is where the size he started at, and then you can see. He ate his vitamins and <laughs> he didn't leave any food on his plate. And by big 20, monkey. He's big by 2021. Kong Island is uh, uh, the land of super food. And, 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 and so, uh, thank you for your presentation. And hey, here comes the next one pretty soon too, right? So yeah. next year we'll be able to talk about that. Next year we'll do like the, the rip-offs and uh, Kong's exploitation films like <laughs> Ape and King Kung Fu. And